Today is Tuesday, October 12, 2010. Welcome back, one and all. Great you could join us. I uh, have a very fun topic to talk about today. Well, they're all fun topics. But uh, in particular, I think today's topic is very important in terms of what we're looking at for the re remainder of the year. Should see the, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average chart right now. Well, any chart you should see. Now, the Dow, because we've passed a 78.6% Fibonacci retracement level, again, the next big uh, level is 11,200. Again, once we pass 10,700, it's took out the possibility of this major head and shoulders pattern. Of course, we always stand the chance of a massive double top pattern. We've had an almost near vertical climb to the upside. There has been, for some reason or another, I can't quite figure out why, there's been a lot of optimism in the stock market if you take away the financial companies, which we're actually going to take, talk about in particular in a moment. My per, um, personal suspicion is that when we look at the federal funds futures, those are the futures, the, the futures traders that make bets when the Federal Reserve and the U.S. is going to raise interest rates, I was watching the Fed Funds futures after the release of the non-farm payrolls. I think it was 95,000 job loss last Friday uh, when they kept rates, uh, when the, I should say, the unemployment rate was kept at 9.6%. Actually, some economists expected us to go to 97 But when we look at the Fed Funds futures, the, the, the expectation that the Federal Reserve in the U.S. will raise interest rates by this time next year, third quarter, fourth quarter, 2011, that expectation a few months ago was above 50%. We are, and it has continued to drop meeting after meeting after every Federal Reserve meeting and after pretty much every non-farm payroll meeting in, in recent history, those futures have continued to drop, meaning every time we get a big piece of data, there's the, the futures traders basically think, okay, now we have even a less of a chance that the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates anytime soon. Well, if you think about it in terms of from the perspective of a business owner, a publicly traded company, Bank of America, uh, Microsoft, Google, whoever it may be, low interest rates, it's, it creates a better environment for those corporations. Low interest rates means that, number one, those companies can borrow money cheaper for research and development and expansion. And number two, low interest rates make it more affordable for consumers to go out and buy those products if they choose to finance those products. Uh, such as if I want to buy a house, I get a 30-year mortgage. Now, what, the 4.3% level. If I want to buy a, uh, a car, I can go to Ford or General Motors or any one of the automakers. They're offering near 0% financing. If I want to buy a couch, the furniture stores are offering 0% financing or close to it. So low interest rates are, are, or I should say interest rates are brought down to stimulate the economy. Because interest rates are so low for so long already, and because the federal funds futures basically indicate that we only have the last number I heard was an 18% chance, if I remember my, my numbers correctly, there's an 18% chance the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates by this time next year. Well, the stock market says, hey, that's great. Despite the very, very weak economy, if I have an almost, you know, if I have an 82% chance that we're going to have almost near zero interest rates, for the next year, imagine how many more cars and couches and TVs and airline tickets, et cetera, that the consumers would buy based on those low interest rates. I think that's one reason why the stock market is so strong. I can't look at the unemployment rate at 9.6% and justify it that way, or an anemic uh, consumer price index number, or non-farm payrolls with losing 95,000 jobs uh, last month. That doesn't tell me that any, any credible reason why the stock market is going up. But that expectation of very low interest rates, I think, really does encourage the stock market to move higher. As stocks move up, it does make sense that the bonds move down because, after all, the bond market has to offer a higher yield to compete with higher stock prices. Therefore, the value of the actual bond goes down. You know, stocks go up, bonds go down. And as interest rates stay low and the dollar tends to lose its buying power, I'm sure everyone's seen uh, the dollar hit multi-decade lows against the Swissy, almost uh, pretty much against the yen, against a lot of other uh, major currencies. As the dollar continues to weaken and lose its buying power against other currencies over you know, the big picture, well, 
what financial instrument does well? Gold, because we buy gold as a hedge towards inflationary pressures. The inflationary pressures are not within our economy. The inflationary pressures are abroad, meaning the euro is so high and the pound is so high against the dollar and the Swiss franc is so incredibly high. In order for me to maintain my buying power as from the U.S. dollar perspective, meaning in order for my U.S. dollar to continue to be able to buy this equal amount of euros and pounds and yen, well, i got to buy a little bit of gold to keep pace with that declining dollar. I think that is one of the mechanics that, that's really going on right now. It's very evident uh, within the market. But the crux of this uh, webinar is what I want to do is discuss the major issues that I think could certainly have an influence to not only the U.S. dollar, but also uh, U.S. equity markets and also overseas as well. Uh, these issues, you know, we're all connected. Uh, so I think this is very apropos to uh, a lot of different uh, traders across the world. Now, this piece of news was released October 8th, late last week. It really didn't get a lot of press and initially. I think the media is starting to pick up on it now. I think this, is, could, this could be one of the next big issues that seems to plague us over the next few quarters. So I would pay attention to this. It was reported on Bloomberg.com. Bank of America, the biggest U.S. lender, extended a freeze on foreclosures to all 50 states as concerns spread among federal and local officials that homes are being seized based on false data, as if we didn't learn our lesson enough. They said Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, those are two of the big guys, by the way, and Ally Financial, already froze foreclosures in 23 states where courts supervise home seizures amid allegations that employees used unverified or false data to speed the process. Bank of America's new policy extends its moratorium to the entire nation. Again, it started with 23 states. Now it's across 50 states in the U.S. And the announcement spurred more demands from public officials and community groups for other banks to follow suit. Subsequently, from what I've personally read, they, this has spread to other, other banks as well, the big guys, you know, Citibank, et cetera. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, a uh, Democrat from Nevada, said in a statement on the 8th, all mortgage providers should follow the example of Bank of America and review their practices to ensure that they are not unfairly targeting homeowners in Nevada and across the nation. Um, Skimming down here, at least seven states are investigating claims that home lenders and loan servicers took shortcuts to speed foreclosures. Attorneys, attorneys general in Ohio and Connecticut have said some of the practices used by banks to take away homes may amount to fraud. Acting comptroller of the currency, John Walsh said last week, asked the nation's uh, seven biggest lenders to review foreclosures for defective documents. Uh, spokesman Brian Hubbard had said exactly that. Now, See if there's anything more really pertinent in this article. Lenders took possession of a record 95,364 homes in August and issued foreclosure filings to 338,836 homeowners, or one of every 381 U.S. households. That's according to Realty Track, California-based data vendor. This is big news because basically they put a, a freeze in momentarium. When we talk about momentariums, we think of the BP oil spill. Well, here's another one. Uh, they're putting a freeze on all foreclosure filings as if the housing market did not have enough issues already. Uh, those, pr from what I understand, I've been reading a lot about this, uh, actually speaking to a realty agent as well to get their perspective. From what I understand from this issue, and I, I might not be exactly right, but those proceedings, those foreclosures that are within the process, those are frozen. Uh, and those foreclosures that have already passed through the process that now those properties are, are open, you know, for sale, I think that does not necessarily affect them. But the bottom line is, well, two things. First of all, this does not add any sort of confidence to already very, very weak housing market. Uh, and it actually takes inventory away. After all, if I'm looking for a, a, a home at foreclosure, that's not good if there's the, the, the homes that are halfway through the process. That process is now frozen. I read somewhere or I heard it could be as little as two weeks, but then again, it could be a lot longer. But more importantly than that, and this is not something that I read anywhere, but just kind of my own guess, think of the big companies like Bank of America and Citigroup and J.P. Morgan who have projected and sort of guessed these, are, these will be our earnings for the third quarter. This is how much we're going to make in the fourth quarter. 
those earnings were projected on the assumption that they were going to, you know, process and sell or, you know, flip over a certain amount of foreclosures. What happens to those earnings projections when all of a sudden these foreclosures are not sold? And all of a sudden the bank, which is really the worst case scenario for banks, they're left holding a, a lot more, a much greater amount of homes in foreclosure. Banks don't like to own homes. They like to own cash. Uh, they don't like to own homes at all. Now, it's really, it's, it's kind of a, a continuing disaster in terms of the housing market. And I heard an analyst say the other day that you know, the housing market got us into this mess and the housing market has to get, out of, get us out of this mess. And uh, this certainly is not something that's going to help at the minimum, aside from how it may affect the earnings for the big banks. And if you've been watching the stock market, kind of noticed the banks haven't really participated in this rally. Now in Jones Industrial Average, nearly at 11,000, we have not seen equal moves in the bank stocks. Well, you know, the stock market and uh, the overall economy is made up of very, very smart in the, uh, individuals who look at these issues. So I think there's no accident that the, that the financial stocks have not really gone up as much as other stocks have. What are foreclosures? I can't understand expression. I apologize. Okay, basically, and I am certainly not a real estate expert, however, uh, foreclosures are basically what happens is when we have when we have a house and we miss payments. We can't pay our mortgage month after month and we miss one or two payments. Well, I guess that's okay. But we start to miss many, many payments and uh, we have to talk about the, 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 the homes the technical term is underwater. If I bought a home in 2007 and I paid $300,000, then the housing market went down, and now the house is worth $100,000. Well, my mortgage that I took out, I borrowed money from the bank, my mortgage, my monthly payments are based on that $300,000 loan. So why would it make sense for me to want to continue to pay a $300,000 mortgage, $3,000, $3,500, maybe even $4,000 a month, when I could buy the same home now for 100000 a lot of homeowners are underwater. They're paying more than they, well, I should say they owe to the banks more than the house is actually worth. This happens during every real estate turndown, but it has never been, I think, this significant as we see now. So when, basically, when a bank goes into, when the house goes into foreclosure, meaning when the owner says, you know what, it doesn't make sense for me to continue to pay my mortgage in a house that's not even worth it anymore, or I lost my job because unemployment is at 9.6%, and I literally cannot afford to buy the house to pay the mortgage, well, eventually the bank takes the house back. The bank takes the house back, and, of course, the bank takes a loss. The bank takes a loss because they're not receiving the income from the mortgage payments that they thought they were going to get. And then the next thing you know, we have what's called a foreclosure proceeding where the house is now re-owned by the bank. And then the bank, their biggest priority is they just want to get rid of the house. So they're going to sell it at rock bottom prices just to get break even. That's called a short sale where they're going to basically the same thing like a short sale in the foreign exchange market. We're selling now in the hopes of buying back later cheaper. That's essentially how it works. And I apologize it's not a completely accurate or coherent uh, explanation. Uh, again, I'm not a real estate expert, although the market does fascinate me, as of lately especially. At any rate, this news is not good. I think this is only the beginning. Uh, I think that the, well, we know for sure that the banking industry, the financial industry, really has its fingers in all er areas of the U.S. economy. If we think about the, the, the NASDAQ tech bubble in the year 2000, when the technology stocks and the dot-com stocks crashed in the year 2000, well, Amazon.com at the time, which was only a few years old, or eBay or, you know, Pets.com, which no longer exists, when those companies went from, when the stocks went from, you know, $2 a share to $200 a share and then back down, it really, I mean, it certainly did affect everyone who had money in the stock market. That's for sure. And it did affect those particular people that, you know, essentially either worked for those companies and uh, either lost their jobs or had payroll cuts, et cetera. But it did not affect the economy in such a widespread way that this recession has affected this economy. When a dot-com stock goes down, when pets.com goes down, when, when that company files for Chapter 11, when they file for bankruptcy, 
it affects a very minute amount of individuals, those people that either own the stock or they work for the company or they just want to buy pet food at a cheap level, at a cheap price. But when a bank goes down, the banking stocks go down, and even if a bank goes under, and this is, I think, one of the causes, something else I heard an analyst mention, this is one of the causes of why these these falsified documents uh, were passed forward or reused to push individuals into foreclosure. Sure, you know, some on some part it probably was malicious, but if you think about it, if, if a mortgage company went out of business, a lot of them did, a mortgage uh, lender, Bank of America might have purchased that company. They might not have had a chance or they might not have had a clear understanding to read every single mortgage that they event eventually assumed. That's not good. Well, that I think is the case of just an overwhelming amount of uh, activity in the foreclosure market. I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing these problems. That is one issue. We have a few. That's one issue I think that is certainly going to affect uh, the economy in the U.S., certainly overseas. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, let's see if I can pull up the news. I completely forgot to mention this. But let's see if I can pull up the news really, really briefly. Because when we talk about uh, the housing market, it's not just about the U.S. Uh, we certainly see... There we go. Ooh, I just found news really, really quickly. I remember reading this a little bit earlier today. This was also from Bloomberg.com. A UK housing market gauge fell to a 16-month low in September as the number of properties for sale exceeded demand from the home buyers. Home buyers, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors said. The number of real estate agents and surveyors saying prices fell exceeded those reporting gains by 36 percentage points, down from minus 32 points in August. The London-based group said a report today. In the forecast of 14 economists survey, a measure of options fell to minus 41. That's the lowest since March of, 9, of 2009. This, by the way, is the second piece of housing news, the second piece of negative housing news that I have read in regards to the UK in the past week. Last week, we had another number. I believe, if I remember the, the article correctly, the number had fallen to a level that we have not seen since the beginning of that number, which was back to 1983. For the life of me, I cannot remember what the number is called, but the housing market gauge in the UK. Things are not only bad in the housing market in the US. This housing bubble that burst extends much, much further outside US territories. If you remember, when all these banks started to fall, it could be the Halifax. I think you're right. Thank you, by the way. I, um, it, now that you say Halifax, it does ring a bell. If you remember when the banks fell, memory serves correct. I think the first big bank that actually fell was in, does anybody know? Was it Lloyd's? Is Lloyd's based in the UK? I think it was Lloyd's. Maybe not Lloyd's. It was one of the uh, European-based banks who were actually the first to fall. Uh, but at any rate, what happens in the US, certainly, you no. Know, we're connected. This entire economy is connected. So what's good for us is good for someone else, and what's bad for us is bad for someone else. Number two issue that I think is going to play a very large role, and normally I do not spend a lot of time losing sleep of, uh, over political issues. However, this is different. We have November, what is it, third? We have congressional elections in the Senate and the House of Representatives in the U.S., and right now the Senate and the House is under Democratic control. It is perceived by many that that either the House or the, uh, the Senate or even the governors, uh, the governors across the country could fall into Republican hands. If that happens, it could certainly change entire, not only political spe spectrum, but economic spectrum. This is an issue, again, like the housing market, I'm not an expert. Uh, but from what I understand, the one of the very, very big issues that uh, – that is on the headlines right now in terms of uh, the political ramifications is that the Democratic side of the House and the Senate are more reluctant to uh, – we have these Bush tax credits, these, these, Bush tra these tax credits uh, that have been extended throughout the Bush, uh, the George Bush uh, administration, and every year they have been extended, meaning every year we have decided, okay, this year we're going to keep taxes low again. I don't, they call it a tax hike if we do not expend, extend these Bush tax credits. But basically, 
the argument, the political argument, is the Democrats say, okay, we want to extend these, these tax credits to the lower middle class because really certainly those are the people that are suffering a lot from this recession. The Republicans will say, well, we want to extend them to also to the upper class, you know, to the small business owners and to the very wealthy individuals because after all, you know, small business owners, if we give them a tax break also or if we – not, it's not that we're going to give them a tax break. We're just going to extend the tax credit another year for everyone. And uh, if we do so, then that will encourage small businesses to hire more. There's an expression that says, you know, whoever hires me always has more money than I do. I'm not going to throw myself in the middle of a political debate. However, this congressional election right around the corner, the beginning of November, I think will determine or will play a very, very important role in determining will the uh, tax credits be extended for the lower middle and upper class. And obviously, if tax credit, I think that most economists would agree lower taxes help stimulate an economy. I won't go further than that because I respect everyone's uh, political belief and I don't want to start <laughs> a discussion, uh, a violent discussion on that side. However, really uh, cool website. I'll post it into the, uh, into the chat window over here. www.electionprojection.com. We have a couple different couple different charts. This is for the Senate. Uh, we are, whoops, there we go. It, the, right now, the projection Democrats will nine seats and Republicans will gain 50 seats, if I'm reading this correctly. This is as of October 12th today. This is updated every single day. We take a look at the House of Representatives, and it is uh, projected, here's a nice little chart, by the way, that the uh, Democrats will lose 47, and whoops, and the Democrats, or the Republicans, I should say, would gain 47. And even in the governor's race, the Democrats will lose seven, and the Republicans will gain seven seats, or seven states, I should say, in terms of the governor's race. That is another issue. And I think this is also one of the reasons why the stock market's been so strong as of late, very simply because I think in terms of the economy, from a pure economic point of view, if it's perceived that the control in the House of Representatives and the Senate will move into Republican hands, and then therefore we're more likely to see the tax uh, the, the Bush tax credits extended for another year will lower taxes from a pure economic point of view, I think, on the short term are better for the economy. Now, there's always two arguments of the coin, two sides of the coin. You know, logically, we would say, well, why would the Democrats ever want to oppose, you know, the, the tax credits if, well, lower taxes are good for the economy? And will they say, well, if we extend these tax credits for, you know, these millionaires and billionaires and trillionaires who may not necessarily need it, the cost and the amount that will add to our already enormous deficits, that's not worth it. It's Democratic uh, economists arguing against Republican economists. It's a very, very interesting debate. Without, you know, getting in the middle of it, it is a very interesting debate. I think that over time, over the past six months to a year, as the perception is that the Republicans every day, every month are maybe are going to have a little bit more of a foothold, a little bit more of a possibility of actually winning, you know, back control of either the House, the Senate, or both, that that perception of a, an increased likelihood that we'll have lower taxes for the upper class or maybe for everyone, I think that is also encourages stock market higher. Stock markets, generally speaking, from my experience, do not like elections. Stock markets do not like uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. And again, like I said before, normally I don't pay a lot of attention to politics. I'm more of a purist in terms of the foreign exchange market that I like to look at, you know, the fundamentals of that each respective currency in its country and the stock market and other, you know, associated markets. I think this year, I think we're seeing something very, very special. Very interesting, to say the least. Now, on a more forex related topic we also have some very big news over this is uh over the next you know couple months through the third quarter and the fourth quarter by the way and i'll send everyone the link the fx street website 
has a very, very cool calendar. I sent everyone the link, by the way. And you can uh, select the dates that you want to uh, view and also select to see basically the significance of the news. You can take level one news, level two news, et cetera. I, I tried to isolate only the most significant news. Now, uh, Adrian says, there's a middle solution, tax credits to small businesses only to help poor people. It's a great point. And uh, we have a full room today. And I think if we had 50 members in this room, we would, we would get at least 50 different solutions, all that probably make a lot of sense. This is a problem. They, uh, there's a lot of solutions that make a lot of sense. Plus, it's a very, very heated topic because the economy is not strong. If the GDP in the U.S., if gross domestic product was up at 8%, like it was in the year 2000, and the housing market was strong, and the unemployment was not at 9.6%, but was back in the 4 or 5% area, I think this could be a much more friendly debate. But it is a very, very sensitive topic to many because this affects us so personally in bad economic times. Uh, it really is something that I've, I've learned to appreciate on a whole new level. Take a look at, by the way, it's a great comment. Take a look at, by the way, speaking of the FX Street uh, calendar. These are just some of the big numbers that we expect to see. We had some, well, we had UK Consumer Price Index earlier today. Between now and the end of the year, these are just some of the big, big numbers. Later on today, we have Federal Open Market Committee uh, interest rate meeting minutes. If you recall from the last Fed meeting, the Fed obviously kept rates unchanged as expected, 0 to 0.25%. But what's actually uh, more significant and a little bit shocking is the Fed continued to use very negative language, saying things are not good in the U.S., we're not raising rates anytime soon, uh, and we're not very optimistic. I'm paraphrasing. That's what I took away from uh, the last Fed meeting. It'll be interesting to see. Once we have access to the minutes of the last meeting to see if they continue to use such a negative stance. Again, I've been watching the federal funds futures for quite a while and over the past uh, few months, as we see every non-farm payroll and federal interest, uh, federal open market committee meeting minutes, or not meeting minutes, but meeting, meaning every time we have a Fed meeting, the anticipation of an interest rate hike by this time next year goes down more and more and more. Let's see how the Fed Fund's futures react after the meeting minutes are released. In addition, we have uh, New Zealand Food Price Index, UK Nationwide Consumer Confidence. Just to name a few of the big numbers that could certainly move the market over the next few months. China trade balance, jobless claims in the UK, retail sales in New Zealand, producer price index in the US, um, industrial production in Japan, Bank of Japan's uh, Governor Shirokara will speak, Consumer Price Index in the U.S. Of course, we have non-farm payrolls under the Fed meeting, Swiss National Bank interest rate decision, et cetera. A lot of big numbers. In addition, take a look at the FX Street uh, calendar, the actual central bank calendar. We have, over the next uh, month or two, month to two months, interest rate meetings in the Bank of Canada, European Central Bank, Federal Reserve, Swiss National Bank, I would venture a guess we might even see some of the other uh, central banks meet as well. Those could certainly influence the market. As if that was not enough, we can go to earningswhisper.com. I'll send everyone the link. This website I've used for eons and eons. And uh, the link I sent you is a free calendar that shows us the companies that have scheduled report earnings uh, today. Before the open, you have different buttons. Before the open, during market hours, and after market close. Now, we are at the very, very beginning of earnings season. July and October tend to be the most active earnings seasons. We know earnings are reported every quarter, every three months, January, uh, April, July, and October. October and July in particular, in my experience, it tends to be the most volatile months. October, we know, is not always a very kind month to the market. We can think of October from 2008, October 1987, October 1929. Not to say that this October will, will, will also have such a significant drop. Personally, in the stock market, I'm actually a lot more bearish than bullish. I think we've gone up too much too fast. But I've been wrong until now. <coughs> Excuse me. However, 
be aware that as stock markets, as the volatility increases during earnings season in the stock markets, that volatility will also increase in the foreign exchange market to an equal amount. Today, we don't have a lot of companies to schedule for earnings. However, if you zoom forward, not too much into the future, just to October 27th, take a look at all the companies that are scheduled to report earnings. And these are just the companies that are scheduled for earnings on October 27th before the market opens. There's a lot of them. Allegheny Energy, uh, Arrow Electronics, Canadian Pacific Railway. I'm trying to look for the companies that I recognize here. Dr. Pepper. I know that. Dr. Pepper. Snapple Group. Uh, Hercules Offshore International Paper. That's a big one. Leg Mason. Used to be a big one. Praxair, Procter & Gamble, which is a very big one. Whirlpool. I saw some other very, very big companies. Sprint, Sprint Nextel, et cetera. Save this website in your favorites, and you can see every day what uh, companies are scheduled for earnings. Now, in addition, well, I should say more importantly, the following link, and you can find this very easily on Google, if you were to ask, uh, ask me which companies are most influential in the market, which companies should I really pay attention to, I would t tell you to focus on the Dow Jones Industrial Average components. Those are the 30 stocks that make up the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And those are the 30 stocks that are most, they say, most representative of the U.S. economy. Those companies include 3M, Alcoa, American Express, AT&T, Bank of America, Boeing, Caterpillar, Chevron, Cisco, Coca-Cola, DuPont, Exxon, Mobil, GE, Hewlett Packard, Home Depot. The list goes on and on. Obviously, you can tell by the names, these are the big guys. These are the companies that uh, are... <clears throat> that are really most most effective of or most have the greatest amount of influence to the US economy. Note the days that those companies are scheduled that scheduled to report earnings. Uh, the list by the way goes on and on, including Intel, IBM, Johnson and Johnson, JP Morgan, which is in the middle of its financial mess. Kraft, McDonald's, Merck, Microsoft, Pfizer, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble is on October 27th, I remember. Travelers, United Technologies, Verizon, Walmart, and Disney. Note the days that those companies are scheduled to report earnings. They can really move the market. Now, if Redback, I don't know, I always use that as an example. I don't think it exists anymore. But if it did, and they reported earnings, it might not really have a great influence in the market. But when Apple and Google and Procter and Gamble report their earnings, it has a much, much bigger influence to the stock market. And you know what? The stock market does certainly affects the foreign exchange market. Speaking of foreign exchange market, let's take a look at some of the charts here. Before we get to FX, again, Dow Jones Industrial Average, almost a vertical climb to the upside. And if we were to look, which we will, if we look to the foreign exchange market, we can see an equal correlation that as the stocks have gotten stronger, the dollar has gotten weaker. As the dollar has gotten weaker, we need to buy gold. This is gold, by the way. Gold in order to sustain our buying power. Gold in almost near vertical climb up. Remember those analysts that said gold is at 500, it can't go any higher? No, no, no. Now it's at 1,000, it can't go any higher. Now we see a double top at 1200 while futures on gold right now hit 1350.20, yesterday hitting highs at 1364.80. Who knows when gold will stop? The only thing we do know for sure is the trend is your friend, and so far buyers have been rewarded and shorts have been punished. Uh, now, I would not necessarily go out there and buy gold at this point, but please respect the trend because so far it is literally on a vertical climb up. And as far as the market is concerned, there's not a big difference between 1300 to 1350 or 1400. It could go on and on, which it has so far. I think, you know, I think we're a lot closer to the top than the bottom. That's probably not a big statement to make, right? <laughs> uh, but I think that when we see a turn, what I really believe is that when we see a turn, when gold hits, I don't know if it'll be the all-time high. We might make higher highs. But when gold eventually reaches a critical top and turns back to the downside, I think that will coincide very, very closely with a reversal in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. 
and also in the dollar cross. Question is, do you remember the Dow two head and shoulders panel, which we talked about in previous webinars? They failed now. You're right, they did. Let's take a look at them. Well, one did and one worked. I'll show you what I mean. If we look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, this is a futures chart, by the way. We have at the very, very top, we have the head of a massive head and shoulders, which I personally really kind of believed in. That when the futures hit highs of 11,201 on April 26. Prior to that, we had a high, the first shoulder of a head and shoulders in January, and the second shoulder of a head and shoulders in August. Now, hindsight 2020 and all that, looking back, seeing that the Dow came back down, established a higher low, and then was able to reachieve a higher high, the writing kind of was on the wall, and I might have mentioned this, I won't take credit, I might not have. I remember thinking at least that it was a little bit suspicious that the Dow came all the way back up to 10,700. But eventually the real confirmation that this neckline at 10,700 that was supposed to contain the Dow Jones Industrial Average that finally failed, that again occurred when we broke above 10,700. The head and shoulders that did work was the upside down head and shoulders. Now, the upside down head and shoulders is the same thing. It's a triple, instead of a triple top, we have a triple bottom with the center high or the center low being higher or lower than the first or second shoulder. First shoulder low on the upside down head and shoulders, we could say it goes back to May of this year. The head all the way to the bottom in July. The second shoulder, which by the way, notice is a higher low than the first shoulder, really gave us a nice clue. Hey, the Dow is on its way higher. Head and shoulders tend to break in the opposite direction of the head. So the upside down head and shoulders work meaning we broke to the upside. Where could we go? It's a great question. We could see a double top at 11,200. We passed the last Fibonacci level. Again, if you draw those Fibonacci's moving from the 11,200 highs all the way down. The next big level is 11,200. We could certainly reverse here. Who knows? The next big level is 11,200. We know if we break above 11,200, that'll put us at levels we have not seen going back to September of 2008. I have been bearish and I have been wrong up until this point. So I would say, who knows? No, I mean, it's, we have, we have a stock market that's generally speaking, all markets are sort of attracted to big round levels and attracted to stop orders. So certainly it's a possibility, especially in the middle of a very active October earnings season, the Dow could certainly move higher. I find it hard to believe fundamentally how this could happen. You know, with these foreclosure news that we read about on the beginning on the top of the hour, uh, 9.6% unemployment, 95,000 job loss in, during reported last non-farm payrolls, all these other really enormous issues that for the most part are quite negative in the U.S. economy. Why is the stock market going up? Well, maybe because we have such a low interest rate environment and every piece of bad news that we continue to receive day after day gives the Federal Reserve more reason to keep rates low, more stimulus measures, gives these congressmen and these senators that are facing these elections in the next month more incentive to really do as much as they possibly can to help the economy. So in a sense, we could say bad news is good for the stock market because the stock market is sick right now. It has a flu. Every time it's a little bit more symptomatic, we have a stuffy nose and a cough, Every time we sh the stock market, or I should say the economy, shows another symptom of, of, of sickness, of the flu, we get more medicine. More medicine being lower interest rates, stimulus measures, spending, you know, to try to stimulate the economy, et cetera. Maybe that's why the stock market's so strong. The neckline, and I'll, I'll zoom out just again because I think it's important to identify the head and shoulders, a major head and shoulders. First one is we have the standard head and shoulders. The head is at the top. The highest high uh, is April 26th of this year, April 2010. First shoulder was January. Second shoulder was August. January and August represent the neckline of these head and shoulders. And the, at 10,700, the head is at the top. Now, my chart is a chart of the future, so the levels might be a little bit different. If you're looking at a regular cash market chart, I think uh, the levels might be a little different. The upside down head and shoulders, 
<coughs> excuse me, is the head at the bottom. That's July this year. The first shoulder, we have a double bottom pattern May and June of this year. The second shoulder was a higher low going to August 31st, uh, late August of this year. And that extends down to 97.50 up to, well, those lows, 9,900 split the difference. About 9,800 represents the approximate neckline of the upside down and head and shoulders. So we would, we did say that we're looking for a break either above 10,700 or a break below 9,700. 10,700, 9,700. A break above 10,700 could lead us to a double top at 11,200. A break 90, below 9,700 would have led us to a low near the 9,500 level. Now, as stock markets continue to go down, or I should say continue to go up, what am I saying? As stocks continue to go up, bonds go down. Bonds go down, interest rates accordingly uh the expectation of higher rates goes down. And if we believe that there's only an 18% chance in the federal funds futures that the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates by this time next year, remember, the number one reason why foreign exchange markets move is the anticipation of higher lower rates. We could say, well, I'm going to guess. I think the Bank of England will probably raise rates maybe not this year. I'm guessing maybe the first or second quarter of next year. I think the European Central Bank might raise rates around that time, too. I think if the economy continues to improve in Canada, I think we have a very good chance to see higher rates in the Bank of Canada soon, maybe in Australia and New Zealand as well. Those are commodity-based uh, economies, which historically have done very well as of late. Why would I want to buy a U.S. dollar if I have a much better chance of having higher rates in Canada or in Australia or in even the U.K.? Well, that very low anticipation of higher rates in the U.S. is, I think, one of the big reasons why the U.S. dollar is so weak. Ninety-five, ninety-seven dollar Swissy. This is a monthly chart. The current monthly candlestick hit lows in ninety-five fifty-three, and by the way, ninety-five fifty-three passed below ninety-six forty-eight lows going back to March of two thousand eight. This is a monthly chart. Normally, I don't use monthly charts. However, this is the lowest low we've seen in a very, very long time. Again, my charts go back to 1988. This is the lowest low we've seen since then, and probably a lot further back. Gold, by the way, high gold prices tend to benefit the Swiss franc. So the dollar Swissy really is the perfect storm of all currency pairs. You have gold at all-time highs, which benefits the Swiss franc, against the dollar at all-time lows, a very strong dollar, uh, gold, a very strong Swiss franc, I should say, a very weak dollar, you put the two together, we have Swiss franc and multi-decade lows. We have the dollar against the Aussie. That's the Aussie dollar currency bear, 98.27. This is a weekly chart last week. We hit 99.15. Multi, multi-decade highs on the Aussie dollar. Australia, by the way, is one of the largest producers of gold and the raw material. So that certainly does benefit Australia. We've seen also almost as significant Lows on a dollar against the Japanese yen. Dollar yen, 81.83. Next very big low is 79.75, going back to April of 1995. And uh, if we cross below, below those lows, on again, on a monthly chart, that's the lowest lows we've seen since 1988. So the dollar against the Swissy, against almost the yen, and against almost the Aussie, has hit critical, critical lows. And this really reinforces my opinion that, look, gold is going up. I know it has gone up a lot, but the trend is your friend. It has, we have confirmation from the dollar and we have confirmation from the stock market. I think eventually when the dollar turns, I think gold will turn and I think uh, stock markets will also likely turn as well. I think if they will turn as a result of the major issues that we've discussed, changing or maybe not changing. Uh, again, talk about the foreclosure mess. That is, I think we're just in the beginning of what could be a new mess. We talk about earnings season uh, in U.S. corporations. Uh, we talk about the congressional elections in November. A lot of different issues. And one thing that we did not talk about, and I think certainly will be a big issue moving forward, holiday shopping season, which officially starts at Friday after Thanksgiving in the U.S., 
And we know certain online retailers tend to do well. Amazon.com does well. And if Amazon.com does well, then Federal Express probably does well because they ship a lot of boxes. But aside from that, with consumer prices so low, or I should say the consumer price index and, uh, and consumer confidence and consumer spending so low, I don't expect it to be a very gangbuster holiday shopping season this year. Let's see how it, it turns out. Maybe the strong stock market has deceived economists a little bit. Maybe, and I haven't read anything yet, but I'm guessing strong stock prices, analysts and economists might want to give us a little bit of good news and say, hey, the stock market's almost at 11,000. We might have a good holiday shopping season this year. Maybe the retailers will pull us out of the recession. I don't think so. I think personally the housing market got us into this mess. The housing market has to be the one that gets us out of this mess. I don't think we're going to get out of this recession without the housing market mounting a major, major recovery. But, again, those are the issues I think that could be most influential during the third and also fourth quarter of this year. Before the fourth quarter of this year, I'm out of time. However, if you have any questions, email me or contact me directly, www.forexlounge.com. That's my contact information. You can contact me there. Uh, please see FX Street's calendar, by the way, because we have a lot more later on this month. I want to thank you all very much for joining us. Very special thanks to FX Street. Wish you all a great day. All profitable trades. And we look forward to seeing you back. <laughs>